Hey, this is Ryan. Hey, Ryan, how's everything going? Hey, good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm very excited about this conversation. Me too. For some odd reason, when you sent me those pictures, like I've been taking notes literally since we decided to, you know, have this conversation. So I literally just went on this deep dive. And then when I got the images that you sent me, it literally just threw like the huge monkey wrench. I was like, oh my God, this is a whole oh, bunch of stuff I did. No, Not no, a, and no, I don't mean no, that in a, in a bad way. I mean that in a great way. <laughs> okay. The question that came to mind was, after seeing all that, do you consider yourself prolific? Well, there's a lot in me, and I'm always just trying to get it out as efficiently as possible. And so when you ask the question is, am I prolific? That needs to be considered in a context. So yeah. look at Picasso, look at Warhol. I don't think my output approaches theirs. So no, I'm not. <laughs> but you're also a lot younger. Like you, you still have a long way to go. I don't know. I don't know. I'm <laughs> Lord um, willing. approaching. I'm a, I'm yeah. Well, yeah, I'm approaching 50. I do want to say congratulations on Mindscapes. Oh, thanks. I walked in and I was just immersed in the experience. Thanks for saying that. That's definitely, uh, that was the idea, you know, to create an immersive environment and um, to expand, you know, expand the paintings. You know, the pain, paintings couldn't be really contained in singular picture planes. And so um, that's good to hear. Great. Thank you. Was there a point when you had the idea where you, all, you said, all right, I would like to create this painting of painting, so to speak? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, the opportunity uh, came to me to do a project with Miles McHenry Gallery. And that's exactly how I received the invitation as an opportunity to do a project, not necessarily an exhibition or a proper or formal exhibition. Um, I wanted to make more of a more of a statement and do something specific to the gallery. So that was the starting point. And then, you know, the gallery has a few spaces uh, on 22nd Street, and then they got a new third space, and then, of course, the space on 21st Street. And so all the spaces were on offer to me, and I, I wanted that 21st Street space because it offered the opportunity to create a singular statement. Like you could take in whatever was going to be installed in mm -hmm. that space all at once. So I wanted to make one grand statement. From the outside, before you even walk in from the street, you can see the grand statement in its entirety. That was the idea. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I chose that space. And then from there, um, I started sketching out just a whole brainstorm of different concepts. At one point, it was going to be all of my, what I call the studio views, which are the paintings within the paintings with the studio floor rendered in a um, kind of an iconic wood grain. And that was going to create a horizon line that was going to wrap around. So you'd be walking into the studio, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then there would be paintings within. That was one idea. Another idea was to kind of collage together paintings of all different sizes and have it be more of a jumble. Another idea was to saturate the space with street signs. That's another body of my work, using the same materials that the Department of Transportation uses to make their signs, to just hang street signs all over the place. That was another idea. And then I you know, just kind of settled on and I brought the gallery in to, um, to weigh in on all the different ideas. And we kind of settled on this idea of kind of one grand painting that is from what I call the Mindscapes series. And then, you know, it just kind of evolved so that at first it was all just be super saturated picture planes, right? And then as I was sketching it out, then I found more spaces and moments to pause and more composition started to evolve within the paintings. And then other bodies of work crept in. So there's what I would call the black holes, which are the flourishes that kind of fold in on themselves and then some figures kind of folded in and then there are some more narrative elements in there you know it evolved it started with you know a basic concept which was to do something site specific and have one statement and then it just got refined over, over a period of a few months what was one of the biggest challenges where you take 72 canvases you know, nine different sizes, six feet tall, 127 mm -hmm. feet long. What were some of the challenges to 
just incorporate your idea into those constraints or were those uh they weren't constraints they were just formatted as you went well i guess a, a kind of a, a system started to emerge as i laid out all the different sizes and all the different sizes started to settle into yeah, just like you said, I think there are nine different sizes. Mm-hmm. I tend to take a very systematic approach to making my work. So whenever I can see a system emerging, I'll embrace it and run with that. So the formats started to kind of emerge and the quantity started to kind of bubble up. And I tend to get hung up on numbers and I, I need a real good reason for there to be a number attributed to something. So why 72? I, you know, it may have fallen initially like around maybe, I don't know, maybe it was 75, maybe it was under 72. And I thought, well, I should just snap it into a, a, a number with meaning. So all my work and this work in particular is, is somewhat autobiographical. So mm-hmm. I, I decided to make it 72 representing my year of birth. The height is my height. So I'm six feet tall and born in 72. And that's where those numbers come from. And then the 127 feet come from the site specific? Comes from the space. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And while, and this was important to me, for me too, while it is site specific to that space, it can also be easily reconfigured to any other space okay. because the um the breaks in that in that linear picture plane that's made up of smaller you know panels all the breaks are vertical and there are other vertical um this is where that long rectangle breaks as well so it could be in it could be on two walls it could be on one wall it could be on several you know walls and have it snake around any other any other space can we talk about the macro and the micro scale to it because as i walked around you know, I did a few laps. I felt like just doing one lap was wasn't going to do it justice. Like the first lap, I did real casual, just kind of like walked around, took it all in. Then the second lap, I went in like I kind of got a little closer than I should. You know, there was no line on the ground, so I kinda, <laughs> <laughs> and of course I didn't touch anything. But I'm I'm in there. I'm looking. You know, so I'm seeing the various statements one of my favorites of course is the the french kiss and then there's like a just a number of pieces in there that i took pictures of that even when you know the good people at the gallery gave me a book i couldn't even find the pieces because i took pictures of them on my phone <laughs> i couldn't even find them in the book i felt like if i went there two or three times i would see something new well thank you for taking the time and you're right there are a lot of details to discern in those paintings and you're absolutely right there are kind of micro compositions and then macro compositions. But that's not to say that they relate. In fact, there's no overarching narrative and there's no linear way to read the work. Mm. And this is reflective of how our minds work. You know, our minds are basically RAM, you know, random access memory to borrow a computer term. You know, that's reflective of our, you know, our, our daily subconscious thinking or, you know, our, 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 our dream state. And, um, there are a lot of discrete units of meaning within those paintings and there are a lot of words, but there are no complete sentences. So no stories, no stories, except on the, on a micro level within each symbol, you know, there are, you know, a whole range of, um, well, again, what I call kind of units of meaning or each of those symbols that I'll sometimes liken to, different elements, you know, they're the, 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 the base units. And then when you combine the elements together, you'll get different compositions, much like in, in chemistry. And I felt like your work, it's asking you to interpret it. But if I was with someone, what they think it is and what I think it is, it's probably going to be two different things. It's almost like interpreting a dream. That's right. And I think that's, that's kind of the, the beauty and the, and the poetry of art. Mm-hmm. You know, it allows you to bring something to the work. It doesn't dictate as opposed to like, and I come from a design background and that's what I studied, you know. And so what I learned from my uh, design background is that the burden of communication is really on, on the communicator. You know, if I create something and it doesn't communicate to you, whatever that message might be, then I've failed. I think a lot of times in art, that burden is on the, the viewer or the receiver. 
And so that's where I think a lot of people feel that art has failed them or or betrayed them because uh, they might feel that they just don't get it, you know? I've been in situations where, you know, say like if you walk through an art show, you walk through Basel, you walk through Scope or anything like that, and, you know, I've gone with friends and they're kind of just like, the eyes is gloss over. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't have to get everything, you know, like just right. gravitate to things that move you and then kind of go from there. And, you you know, it's an, it's more of an it's more of an experience than anything. That's right. That might be the difference between art that invites you, you know, and then art that's maybe not so friendly, you know. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Especially nowadays as you walk the streets and I, you know, I grew up in Queens, but I spent a lot of time in the Lower East Side over the last few years. There's been this merge where sometimes I'm looking at art whether it's sculpture or whether it's street art or graffiti or what have you. But then sometimes I can't even tell what's an ad and what is art <laughs> because they've commissioned certain artists to do you know their logo in a way where it's hidden there's a lot of overlap that's happening today right right i see that as well can you speak on pure geometry in your work sure well when i am developing my drawings they all start with you know ink on paper and sketches and i will often use you know, vellum or, or tracing paper to make multiple kind of iterative sketches, all in an effort to move the drawing or the solution along. I'm, I'm searching for what the drawing really wants to be and trying to find the underlying geometry. I find a lot of um, truth in geometry. And so if I see something wants to be a perfect arc, then I'll make it an arc or a curve or lines that want to be parallel will be exactly parallel, right angles are true right angles, etc. And then when I get to a stage in the drawing or sketching process where I feel like that underlying geometry is starting to emerge or that underlying system, then I'll bring it into the computer and make a more technical drawing where I can kind of shore up a lot of those um, you know, for instance, arcs and parallel lines again, and make sure that right angles really are right angles. And then that's when I'll make uh, turn the drawing into uh, a vector file, you know, which is really just an equation. You know, it's really just information. Oh, yeah, it's mathematics. I do a lot of stuff in Illustrator, and, and sometimes I have to explain to people the difference between raster and vector, and of course, RGB oh, right. and, C <laughs> and CMYK. Of course. Which is kind of a, um, a good segue because I want people to know that they should, of course, know about your work. And it's cool to like look at it in a book or look at it in a video. And But when you see it in person, a lot of what you've done in the several layers that you've done on your canvases do not show up or register the way they do in person. They don't. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's, Does that bother you? Well, it doesn't bother me. In fact, I use a lot of pigments which um, can only be fully appreciated in person. Okay. And so I'm talking about pigments with properties that cannot be reproduced, like fluorescence. Fluorescent paint is a you know, real-world phenomenon. Metallic paints are a real-world phenomenon. Iridescent, pearlescent, uh, varnishes uh, that reflect light, and even metal leafing is a material that can only fully be appreciated, again, you know, in person. You know, it's it's difficult to reproduce them either on the screen in RGB, as you as you mentioned, or or in print with CMYK. You know, sometimes some catalogs I've done for exhibitions uh, will include a couple extra colors. So there's hexachrome printing, CMYK, plus an orange, plus a green to pump up the colors a little bit. But at the end of the day, you're talking about simulation. What you're getting at with the question is like, is, you know, does it bother me that there's a difference between, you know, real world and simulation? Well, no, it doesn't bother me. That's that's just how it is. What I love most about these particular paintings is the background in, in some in some paintings you can see, say, like, you know, brush strokes. I couldn't see any brush strokes, of course, because of the screen printing. But in the background, I guess in the pearlescence, there was these like kind of like swirls that were very inviting. If you weren't really paying attention, they would you just wouldn't see them. But they they were art in themselves the way they were presented. There's a, a variety of techniques in, in these paintings in particular, um, not just silk screening. But you're right. There's a lot of brushwork in those in those backgrounds with pearlescent paints 
which purposefully, uh, you know, catch the light at you know different angles. So there's a lot of cross hatching, mm. um, and I, <laughs> you know, so when I say there's brushwork, there's actually it's a very particular kind of cross hatching that's very even, and is designed to catch the light at all all different angles. In 1984, you wrote a a paper titled "Communication Through Art." Oh right, yes, that that, that you, was in our I elementary school. I can hear the pause. You're like, uh, where are you going with this? <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, hmm, eighty four. Where was I? But yeah, I was twelve years old, and you're right. I wrote this paper called "Communication in Art." And, you know, on occasion, I'll give uh, lectures. So I've I've started on occasion. I have started my lecture by reading that paper without telling anybody wow. <laughs> what I was doing, and then. I can, you know, uh, uh, slowly see the audience look at each other, and maybe people get up and leave because you know it's written, you know, as a, as a, in in a child's voice, right? right? And I think I talk about Michael Jackson and Pepsi and Star Wars in that paper, um, and then there's a reveal at the end that I was just reading from, you know, my twelve year old self. But yes, that, that, that's a paper I wrote. <laughs> My question is, was that title a hypothesis or maybe a thesis? I may be using the wrong word to essentially launch your journey to where you are now to Mindscapes. As you look at the paintings, they are communicating and it is art. So, I mean, is that is there anything there? Well, I, I, <laughs> I think there is there. You could definitely make the argument that there's a through line. That started at about that time, again, in elementary school, where I became very curious about, well, art and what I would later come to learn as design and graphic design and the difference between the two. And I, you know, went to a school for um, gifted and talented kids for art when I was young. Uh, And so I, from a very young age, I took the pursuit of art very seriously as opposed to most kids' experience with art where it's maybe an elective or an easy grade or a goof-off class or something like that. From a very early age, it was a very serious pursuit for me and a heavy one, like a really heavy pursuit. And then, you know, I gravitated more toward making graphics and um, painting skateboards and decorating shirt, you know, t-shirts and making stickers and making zines and things like that. And then in, in high school, at some point, I, I learned that all of those activities were called the graphic arts. And that's really what I wanted to study. You know, I loved, you know, working with lettering machines and on photocopiers and typesetting and um, silk screening. And so that's what I went off and studied, which again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the the basic premise is is and the goal is to communicate, um, you know, visually. There was an interview that you did back in 2001 with Takashi Murakami. He interviewed you and you were talking about, I don't know if your answer has changed the difference between art and graphic design. Yeah, the um, I went on his, uh, you know, he invited me to be on his uh, radio show when I was in Tokyo. Uh, thanks for listening to that. That's that that is uh That was a great interview. Reflective of of, of a deep dive. <laughs> I think that's buried on the website somewhere. <laughs> it is, but so thank you yeah. for finding that. Okay. Yeah. And I mean people should know. I mean the information is still relevant. You know, you were saying something to the extent yeah. of art is commodities based, is a commodities based industry like things and installations and even performance, but it's about communicating your ideas. Uh, as opposed to graphic design being a service, but I don't know if that's correct. Yeah, no, I, th- I think I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, as far as industry goes, I mean, this is aesthetics aside and concepts aside. Okay. Um, just the basic the basic industry, you know, the difference in the industries is that you know, design really is a service industry. Um, and I was never really good at providing a service. What I loved was drawing. I wasn't very good at you know the salesmanship of it, you know, or assuming a client's problems as my own. You know, I've got right. I've got plenty of my own problems, you know. <laughs> yeah. I so, um, so yeah, so I was never very good at the industry side of all of that. I just again, I just loved drawing. Can you talk about using beauty as a Trojan horse? Oh sure, yeah. You know, um, 
you know, it's funny. I had an experience rather recently where um, an art consultant brought uh, her collector over to look at a painting in particular and wanted to know some of the particulars of the symbols and and uh, have me uh, kind of decode or explain some of the imagery because upon first glance, the painting is uh, beautiful. And I try to make beautiful and aesthetically pleasing things. But when you take a closer look and start to decode the individual drawings and the individual units of meaning, some of them are, are, are dark and disturbing. You know, there's there's a lot of suicide in there. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, um, there's some skull fucking. There are a lot of like uh, orgies and sexual references. Even that uh, that French kiss, that French kiss where the one is, tongue is going into the other one all the way to their stomach. That's right. That's right. Like that would blow me away if I gave someone a kiss and it and it <laughs> in my stomach. <laughs> I'd be horrified. <laughs> That's right. But it looks aesthetically pleasing. Like it looks really cool. But if at second, like if you look at it again, you're like, wait a minute. Would I ever want that to happen to me? That doesn't even remotely look fun. I think that drawing is a great example of a, a a symbol that you know because it's rendered in you know like a lot of my drawings. There, it's rendered in a very kind of universal icon mm-hmm. um, aesthetic, you know, so it speaks with a certain kind of authority. In fact, it might even look like it's been sourced from some somewhere else or appropriated. Um, but in fact, it's an original drawing. And because it speaks with that kind of visual language, uh, you might just kind of, like you said, gloss over it. But then when you actually start to decode it, like, well, well, wait a second. And mm-hmm. so it requires a, you know, for you to do a, um, you know, almost a double take to, uh, get past the aesthetics to decode the meaning one of my favorites is a uh, rainbow fuck you yeah 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 the uh, two middle fingers that form a, a rainbow and you may see the rainbow first and just kind of gloss over the middle fingers and then again at second glance you're like wait a minute <laughs> wait where's this going <laughs> right right so uh, th- this comes back to your original question which has to do with using beauty as a trojan horse the aesthetics get you in and then you know once you're kind of behind the enemy walls then the then the meaning comes out of that you know comes out of that gift and attacks you <laughs> exactly if you and and it catches you like it just sidelines you right right have you ever like uh just taken a glance at say like hobo signs and symbols and codes like that oh of course of course Man. henry dreyfus um published a uh, you know, a famous volume on, on signs and symbols that included uh, a lot of those hobo signs and symbols. There was a great documentary called uh, Who is Bozo Texino? It's a great documentary about that as well. It's a black and white. Like, it's kind of hard to find, but if you Google it, it'll pop up. Okay, cool. I'm, but I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off when you were talking about Henry and the book. No, 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 no. Sorry, just, just that there's a great book that decodes a lot of those hobo signs. Um, along with some kind of more mainstream signs and symbols from like the Department of Transportation and, um, you know, some of the sign symbols that have been developed for the Olympics, you know, over the years. Um, Henry Dreyfus has kind of collected all of those into a great, great book called, I think it's just straight up signs and symbols. You sold your first painting to a teacher for 60 bucks? Yeah, I think that must have been like sixth grade. What did that do for you? Did that were you going to be an artist regardless or was this kind of like, okay, I'm on the right track? Oh yeah. No, no, it it was no confirmation, you know, attributing, you know, a a, a dollar value to my work. But the fact that the work was valued, I think was, uh, you know, had, had some kind of a profound effect on me. But the second part of your question, like being an artist, regardless, I, I think that that's definitely the case because I don't think, I don't think people decide to be artists. It's more of an accommodation, you know, rather than a decision. I mean, I work in the creative industry and people kind of look at my decision making. You know, I've had conversations where they're like, I can't live like I couldn't live like how you live. I need to know where my income's coming in. And I'm like, well, I (laughs) I don't like small talk by coffee machines. So it's like, (laughs) touche. That's the trade off, right? I I can't (laughs) help it. Like I, I would love to go I guess corporate, I guess. And I mean, maybe that's still in the cards, but like right now the freedom to be able to just define my day and design my day, it was been pretty addictive since I, since I began, it was scary as hell to take the leap. But then when I got that first taste of it and I was just like, I want more of this. So I fight for my time. Well, I think that's what it comes down to. You know, when you work for yourself, you fight for your time 
and it takes a great deal of discipline and and sacrifice. You know, it means in the very simplest of terms, you know, making decisions about what you value in, in life. You know, you have to reject, you know, a lot of things that other people might value, whether it be just recreational or or family or you know, doing anything else besides your work, you know, and I think sometimes that can be seen as being selfish, but, um, you know, you have to take that as well. How much time do you spend in the studio? I'm in the studio right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess the, uh, the sillier way of answering that is that, you know, there's a studio of the mind that you never escape. So you're always in the studio. Have you tallied how vast your symbol system is? Do you know how many pieces you have? Or it's kind of hard to keep count because do the iterations count? Or do you have a general idea of how many units are in your universe? I love that question because I've asked myself that same question over the years. And last year, I finally took, or, or last year, I finally finished a five-year project of cataloging all of the different elements and putting them into periodic tables by category and by subject matter and also accounting for, you say, variations, which is true, but I would call them, in keeping with the chemistry you know, analogy, they would be like isotopes, you know? Okay. So uh, maybe maybe they uh, vary by one or two electrons. <laughs> so anyway, the point is that, I yes, I, I do know, I can't tell you off the top of my head because they are kind of parsed out into different categories, but I have one massive three-ring binder on my desk with, you know, printouts of little uh, micro thumbnails of all of my drawings you create everything from scratch you would rather be appropriated as opposed to being the artist that appropriates right and that's a that preference is a reflection of what i value and so it's not an attack on you know people who appropriate or can't draw or make their own images and have to you know rearrange and take from you know their surroundings and 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 that approach, but rather it, like I said, it it's just a reflection of of who I am and and what I value. Understood. I don't even know the right word when you approach the Marcel Duchamp bicycle wheel. What would you call that? Yes. So I am then doing my version of the world around me. So I'm making a drawing of that. Okay. That is unique unto me, as opposed to taking someone's photo of that and then reusing that. That's the difference. But that's a great question. Okay, yeah. I mean, I'm just genuinely curious about that because, I mean, there's a photo of a naked woman and then the process of how you get to the symbol. And am I calling it a symbol or an icon or a unit when you get to that final part that makes its way into the painting? You're calling it whatever you want. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I didn't want to be offensive. Um, but, okay. but no, oh my gosh. Oh, please. <laughs> so funny. I'm telling you, sometimes you talk yeah, to artists but, and they're like, whoa, why would you call that an icon? And then they're like, this interview is over. That doesn't happen like that, but I don't, I don't ever want it to happen. But you know what? As an aside, I, I think what you're getting at is that, uh, that most of our offenses are language based mm -hmm. and a, you know, because I think all of us kind of want the same thing at the end of the day. I mean, sometimes our vocabulary doesn't overlap. And when it doesn't, that's when people might be offended, you know, talking about all areas of life, you know. That's good. That's so I good. think I think that's where a lot a lot of conflict comes from, differences in language really. But to answer a question, that's an aside. So in a lot of cases when I'm drawing from life, sometimes I will take snapshots and take photos and then draw from those photos later. That's especially the case when I'm drawing my little girls, um, especially with the mother and child series when they pose with my wife because those girls are super squirmy and they can't hold still. So I'll just take out a series of snapshots, you know, use that as a starting point. Exploiting the analog glitches. Right. And so that's a phrase I've used to describe my approach to, well, silk screening in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, when people work with me in the studio, the first thing I tell them is I don't silk screen the right way or the proper way, which is to say I'm not concerning myself with making multiple reproductions that all match. 
uh, and I don't use hinges and I don't use registration marks. And it's very loose and very free form. And there are a lot of what most people would consider like mistakes. Because I'm using a water based acrylic while I'm bouncing from painting to painting with the screens and with the paint and squeegee. And, you know, there is one of these, you know, so-called mistakes. I have like a three to five minute window of opportunity to decide if I'm going to keep it or, you know, wipe it up and clean it up. And I'll often keep those glitches as a way to express the humanity that goes into the work to signal that that's a mistake. I made that mistake or I didn't intend that or that's a happy accident. But even the decision to include it is a considered one. Like I said, there is a little opportunity there, like a three to five minute opportunity to actually wipe it up and clean it up and to say, you know, actually, that's not a good mistake. <laughs> All because I can see you have a ton of organization and pre sketching and organization. And I mean, there's a lot that goes into before you seem to even begin to grab paint. Is there a part where once the painting is finished, you're seeing it for the first time? You have an initial idea, and then when it's done, something different, or it, it's exactly what you created conceptually? Does it change throughout the process? The process informs the finished painting. And so I will often start with some foggy notion of a composition that sometimes I'll sketch out with a you know, in thumbnail and use scribbles to um, represent a mass of the images. Um, but the paintings always go off on their own. They grow and they do their own thing, even to the point where it's out of my control. And sometimes that's good. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and when it, when I don't agree with it, um, I will. Yesterday, I, for example, I spent a good part of the day sanding down a painting that you know just wasn't working. So on occasion, do have to either paint over or sand down paintings because they've gotten out of control, and I just don't like them. Can you talk about the importance of the Cologne Progressives? Oh, sure. So th this is a group of artists. Uh, let's see, end of. 1920s into the 30s, um, primarily Eastern European. Gerd Arntz was one I really like. Um, Augustin Schinkel. Uh, Fran Seward. Yes, uh, primarily concerned with simplifying the world around them into, again, kind of symbols um, or icons. And this aesthetic development and pursuit was so successful at communicating that it kind of spun off from the formal canon of art history and was kind of co-opted by the state and industry where the images had a utility attached to them. You know, they could be used uh, for infographics and used to, again, kind of communicate. But my interest in these artists and their work is, is solely uh, aesthetic. Got you. Especially kind of getting back into mindscapes where they were talking about early European artists wanting to come off the architecture and be dependent, not as dependent as they have been to the architecture and kind of move on to canvases that were portable. When you look at the gallery that Mindscapes was in, it was site specific. So you specifically made the pieces to fit that, which kind of was a nod to early European artists. Right. And and you're referring to um, the essay in yes. the Mindscapes book, the book written yes. by uh, Jory Finkel, who's a, a great um, writer and critic of art. And this is the value of bringing in, you know, a professional to write about the work. Um, she she saw that connection, and and it's an absolutely valid and substantiated um, assertion that she made. But it's not necessarily one that I really knew about, and it wasn't you know part of my intention. That was part of my question. Yeah, yeah, if you, yeah. If that was your intention. Not necessarily. I absolutely agree with her. And again, that's this is the value of bringing in a, a professional to provide this kind of insight. But and and she also pointed out something which and she really picked up something that maybe I had subconsciously um, been trying to assert with it, with this installation is that I could kind of do something site specific all at once, almost unbearable and unmanageable in that it's one huge painting. 
but at the same time, it could be broken up and easily marketed with singular units and even some smaller groupings. And so it was a way, I think she she actually said that, that I could have my cake and eat it too, mm-hmm. which is absolutely accurate, you know. I do want to say that you can read that article, and I'll put a link on the website. It's on uh, issue.com, and the whole entire book is there. Like, I found the book. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Um, or, or a simulation of the book. A simulation of the book, accurately. absolutely. But it's right. <laughs> all the pages are there for free. Yeah, and and, and that's, that's to the credit of the gallery. I mean, they are incredible. taking great efforts and expense to – you know, contribute to the scholarship of the work of their artists. And so they make that book available, you know, in simulation, uh, uh, you know, online. And I guess that was your question. Like, why? <laughs> yeah, my question is, why are you, I mean, aside from that, like, there's literally hours upon hours of images and process and interviews. Why have you been so vulnerable about your, not vulnerable, excuse me, uh, transparent. Why have I know you, you so, mean, yeah. yeah. So transparent about your process. And I mean, it's clear. It's like, this is how I did it. This is it. Why have you been... Right. Some people, like, they hide that. They're like, no one needs to know. It's proprietary. No one needs to know my process. But you are like, come on in, take a look. Right. I think that fear of sharing is... Well, well let's just say I have no fear of sharing. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> and furthermore, I think... Um, I think when you share your process and you share how you came to a solution, you know, it validates the the work and that makes your solution irrefutable. This is the same strategy, you know, I learned and we all learned when we, you know, solve calculus problems or, or algebra or geometry problems. You you show all your work to show how you got to your solution. Yep. So your solution is irrefutable. Throughout this journey as an artist or just your personal journey, what has been the most important lesson that you've learned so far? Ooh, that's a good question. (laughs) It's a lesson I'm still learning and I need to remind myself of more and more. And that's, you know, it sounds cliche. Everyone says the same thing, but... Listen to yourself, listen to your instinct, honor your intuition, because your intuition is informed by your whole life and all of your experiences. And so mm. your intuition is your your soul and yourself and has the answers. I'm constantly reminding myself of that because I'm someone who, um, on a superficial level, needs a lot of evidence in order to make decisions mm. and i'm i'm driven by logic and sometimes it's not enough for me to say i got a funny feeling about this you know when there's no other evidence to substantiate a feeling and so it's difficult for me to stay in tune with my intuition that's beautiful We'll, we'll wrap it here like that. Do you have any final words or anything you want to say or shout out anybody? <laughs> I just want to thank you for actually preparing and doing a deep dive and doing research. And uh, that is why I wanted to take the time to send you those images, take the time to as much time as you want to speak with you and answer all your questions as thoughtfully as I can, because I wanted to match your effort and um, I just want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I I really, I mean, I really care. I look at this project as an evergreen thing that I felt like years from mm-hmm. now, people can have this audio portrait of this conversation and say, well, that was Ryan and Ryan's words. Like, we don't have to interpret it or we don't have to make up something that he felt like, you know, you can read it, but your voice is powerful. I feel like people's voices are powerful and just on a personal level. When I've interviewed, say, like my grandmother and various people in my family, when 10 years goes by, you listen to it and you damn near want to cry because you're like, so much has changed since that conversation. But listen, don't discount the role you play because you're you're guiding it. And it's and it's as much a portrait of you 
<laughs> as it is of me. Wow. Um, you're, you're, you know, you, nobody can be an objective, you know, reporter. And there's no such thing as an objective documentary, for instance, or an objective document. You know, you're the writer of this, and so there's there's just as much of you in here as you know as, as me. I will tell you a secret, Ryan. <laughs> My goal for every episode is for the guest, whoever interviews them next, they feel like, man. They're not interviewing me like Amon's interviewing me. I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to ruin it for whoever's can... next. Like, <laughs> step your weight up. I'm I'm competitive like that. Like, let's get it. Like, if we're gonna do it, let's do it. No, <laughs> I love that approach and I love that mindset because I try to do the same thing with you know with the paintings I make. I want to ruin it for everyone else. <laughs> yeah, that's what we hear. Like, if we're gonna do it, let's do it. You know, so. And, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks again, Ryan. I sincerely appreciate this cool. conversation. And we're out of here. Peace. Thank you. Bye.